we're a country of horizons. You know, we've always looked at horizons and sometimes to go over them and see, it, see what's on the other side. But this beautiful horizon, and those things don't fit. Stop and think about where we live. If you jump in your vehicle and you drive 150 miles in any direction, this goes away. Much of our story takes place here, in the northernmost part of New Hampshire, Coas County, right next to the Canadian border. But this isn't where the story starts. This story starts in Franklin, a small New Hampshire city 130 miles to the south, where in October of 2010, there was a press conference touting a new electricity transmission line project dubbed Northern Pass. City officials and representatives of the power companies involved talked about the usual positives of a large infrastructure project, things like lots of new jobs and an infusion of tax revenues into the local community. The Democratic governor at the time, John Lynch, was cheering it on. So there are a lot of exciting aspects to this project. As I said, this is a great day for the city of Franklin and a great day for the state of New Hampshire. The governor was aligned with business and Franklin officials, and the press conference ended with a feel-good message of renewable hydropower helping the earth and the local economy. But of course, the story doesn't end there. Let's just say, as the route and scope of the transmission lines became public in the next few months, the locals got restless. Locals like this guy, Rod McAllister, a dairy farmer from Stewartstown, up in Coas County. Well, we try to make milk. It's kind of a hard proposition, but we're still trying. Seven days a week, 365 days a year. I mean, my father was born and raised here, and he and his, his brother, my uncle, farmed together here their whole lives. And my grandfather was here before them his whole life, in a smaller way. You know, he started small with just uh, a few cows and not a lot of land. The home farm was only 100 acres. Uh, we have more love of the land than we do of the animals. You know, milking cows every day isn't all that much fun sometimes. Uh, there may be some people that genuinely love them, but I can't say as I do, but they're okay. You know, they, they're the price you have to pay for having the land here. That's the way we look at it. The land is number one, and the cattle and everything else is number two, secondary. So, yeah, we have a close ties to the land itself. We like it. It's, uh, it means a lot to us. Those who began the protest against Northern Pass were truly from all walks of life. They're Republicans and Democrats, young families, retired teachers, and blue-collar workers. But they all seem to have one thing in common, a connection to the land and its role in defining what makes New Hampshire, well, New Hampshire. It's a connection that is so strong that many question how a project like Northern Pass can even be proposed. Well, when we got out of school, we were... We had jobs at the mill in Groveton, New Hampshire, and we were living in an apartment, and we heard about this 70 acres of land in North Stratford. And we came to take a look. It was a beautiful piece of property, but the house had left a little to be desired. This wasn't here then? It was a little shack with no running water and... No outhouse. Uh, <laughs> not even a rain. Yeah. Not even an outhouse. It was rustic, to say the least. This piece of property it has a stream running through it, beautiful mountains. It's, it's, a way, it's, it's our little sanctuary away from everything. And it's, it's beautiful and it's quiet and it's our spot. Probably going to be here until we're dead, <laughs> to be blunt about it. But we, we, we got very lucky and we made, a, made something happen <clears throat> and uh, living a life that can't say it doesn't get crazy. Everybody's lives get crazy, but this is a dream come true, and we really would hate to have something like the Northern Pass destroy this beautiful, precious piece of land. So here are the basics. Northern Pass is a proposal for a private, for-profit, high-voltage electricity transmission line that will carry electricity from Quebec through more than 180 miles of New Hampshire for distribution in the New England grid. 
The electricity will be carried on cables connected by more than 1,500 steel towers that range in height from 70 feet to 135 feet, with eight miles of cable buried under existing roadways. It's a corporate partnership between Hydro-Quebec, a Canadian power producer owned by the province of Quebec, Northeast Utilities, headquartered in Connecticut, and their subsidiary, Public Service of New Hampshire, also known as PSNH. Northeast Utilities and PSNH have since become part of Eversource Energy. We asked to interview representatives of Northern Pass, and they politely declined our invitation. But they've had plenty of good things to say in public about the project. The fact is uh, that we expect that this project is going to be very successful. It's going to significantly reduce emissions of carbon, and it's going to save hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for customers. So yes, I mean, we wouldn't be proposing this project if we didn't think it had public benefits and public merit. And, uh, but is it a certainty? No, not by any means. Yeah, it's heavily used. It's recreated a lot. It's uh, a main snowmobile trail from Cobrook to Pittsburgh to Diamond Pond to Arrow in just about any way you want to go. Plus, uh, it's a hiking trail in the summer, a hot spot for foliage lookers in the fall. They like the leaves and there's a quite a bit of hunting down. It's used by sometimes hundreds of people a day. We're here because we want to be here. We've had many, many chances to sell land here before Northern Pass was ever thought of for, you know, camps or even maybe second homes or whatever because of where it is. And, you know, there's a big chunk of ground here that uh, is pretty nice. So, no, we've uh, made the decisions long ago. We want to hang on to it as long as, you know, we can. And the thought of selling to Northern Pass isn't an option. I mean, if we sold, I'd want to move away. I wouldn't want to stay in the area, so uh, there's no place I want to move to. I'd rather be here. We're here because we want to be. It's our home, you know, and uh, we're really choice of the land. The money was never a consideration. I'd rather have the land than the money. Money, uh, well, they just don't make land anymore. You know, what you've got is all you're going to have as far as on earth, you know, and. Uh, it's time that uh, some of it was kept and not ruined. And in my opinion, this uh, power line is going to ruin a lot of land, not just mine if it goes. And it'll ruin land just because it's close to it. It won't be the same. People just didn't know what to do. And I said, Chelsea, I am going to put a big four foot by four foot sign down there that says Northern Pass kiss my ass. And the neighbors supported me on it before I did it, the majority of them. So it makes sense that people like Mark and Chelsea and Rod would oppose the construction of these large towers on or near their land. And opposition to Northern Pass has been very strong in northern Coas County, where the first 40-plus miles of transmission lines will be built over a new route. It's a bucolic place filled with farms, mountains, rivers, and forests, and mostly devoid of large development. But south of that first 40 miles, the remaining 140 miles of Northern Pass follows a route that already has a transmission line forging through the forests and towns of New Hampshire. So why is it that opposition is just as strong to that portion of the project? One reason is that the changes to the current right-of-way will be significant. Most of the existing towers are wooden structures that sit below the canopy, often visible only from within the right-of-way itself. Northern Pass will add additional steel lattice towers that are significantly taller, reaching well above the trees, making them visible from tens of thousands of acres from Dummer to Deerfield. This will dramatically alter the rural feeling to the landscape and impact thousands of people who live along the route. In addition, the lines cross the White Mountain National Forest and one of the most popular units of the National Park System, the Appalachian Trail. You know, for those who haven't been out on the trail, they sometimes wonder, what is it that brings people to the Appalachian Trail? What are the rewards and the benefits and the experiences? And, you know, there are several that I think most people would agree to. 
and that's you know the chance to be out in nature, in the elements, uh, under your own uh, your own devices. I mean, there you you have to carry your pack, you have to negotiate difficult terrain and uh, water crossings and weather and everything else. So there's a challenge element to it. And there's also the benefits of you know getting on top of a mountain and seeing the grand sweeping view that you earned by getting there. Uh, chance to see wildlife, chance to uh, have a sense of quiet and peace in the world, particularly here in the east where we have many busy lives and a lot of activity going on off the trail. So it's a respite in some ways from, from that hecticness, even if you're just out for the day. The National Scenic Trail was established through the National Trails Act in 1968. It was an act passed by Congress, signed by President Johnson, that began to develop a system of trails, recreational trails across the United States. And the Appalachian Trail was designated the nation's first National Scenic Trail. And the idea behind a National Scenic Trail is that it's, it's managed for recreation and scenic values and a protected landscape that makes sure that those values are upheld. And uh, it's, it's as important as any other national park unit. The Appalachian National Scenic Trail has the same standing as Yellowstone, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Acadia, etc. Uh, so we're, we're uh, actually approaching an opening here. Uh, we're in the White Mountain National Forest in the Kinsman Range and we're coming up to an opening where there's a transmission line crossing and uh, does does provide a view. However, the view is marred by, by this development and it's somewhat unusual in New Hampshire for there to be a crossing like this this, this far in the backcountry. Uh, there are locations to the south of New England where there's more frequent power line, uh, transmission line crossings, but not so much up here. So uh, this is this is fairly unusual for this this part of the AT in in New England or in New Hampshire. Okay, so a lot of people don't want to see new towers in their town or on the Appalachian Trail, but this is a supposedly clean energy project that should reduce our carbon footprint, which most people support. As we'll see, this environmental benefit, like most of the facts related to energy production and distribution, are more complicated than they first appear. How darkly can we, how dark a green can we color hydropower, what do you think? Uh, it's a deep, dark green. It's, uh, I think there, there have been those studies, in fact, world-class, uh, multi-year studies that have been done by Hydro-Quebec, and they're very, very extensive, and, and they, they have proven that it is as green as green gets. Um. If we want to keep the lights on, do we need uh, this power today? Perhaps not. But what's in that bucket of energy that's lighting you know, your studio today? It's carbon-based power that's more expensive than this power. So the question is not, uh, do we absolutely need it to keep the lights on? It's like, do we need it because it's cleaner and it's more economic? What's the balance? What's the trade-off? So emissions from large-scale hydropower in Canada the science says that those emissions are actually, in the early years after you build a reservoir and you dam a river, are actually comparable or close to the same as a natural gas plant that's operating right now in New England. Uh, when you dam a river and flood a vast forested area, you know, you basically eliminate that forest's ability to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And you also flood a wide variety of biological material in these vast areas, which then, when it's underwater, decomposes, which releases a lot of CO2. So this is a slow process. It takes place over the course of about a decade. So if you bring down additional power from Canada that has that characteristic, and you do what Northern Pass is proposing, which is to simply displace some natural gas power, you may not get a meaningful benefit uh, out of importing more power. When you're in a rural place like this, you have a feeling of, of calm. I do. You have a feeling of tranquility. 
the landscape welcomes you. You don't look at it and feel that overstimulation and that busyness that you have with more developed areas. They created this partnership called Northern Pass, which is a private partnership. It's not a public utility. And they, the Hydro-Quebec wants to sell the power to Northeast Utilities. That has nothing to do with us. Nothing. And, you know, they make the argument, oh, it'll all go into the New England grid. Well, guess what? New Hampshire is a net exporter into the New England grid. We're not going to get anything out of this. And we'll lose so much. Uh, across uh, New England, uh, we have one basic electric system that's operated by the New England system operator. In total, when you add up all the potential capacity in the market, there's probably about 34,000 megawatts. Um, on a peak hot, hot day or a cold, cold day in the winter, um, it's not unusual for 28,000 megawatts, for example, to be called upon. Um, but that's an extreme event. Um, they're uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. It may range from as low as uh, maybe 16,000 megawatts on a, on a um, cool, sunny day um, or uh, in the middle of the night. So as a general rule, uh, there's a general acceptance that there's plenty of capacity in New England today. This is what's called an elective transmission project. It is being solely pursued for the benefit of the project sponsors because it makes economic sense for them. It's not being pursued because the grid has asked for it um, or it's needed to keep the lights on. We realize right, right now what a privilege we have to live here, what a special place it is. It has almost a Shangri-La appeal, you know. There are still families here whose ancestors, you know, pulled the, the first stumps and moved the first rocks here. So there's a real close attachment to the landscape. And a power line doesn't fit in that scenario. My husband came from a family who valued land. They grew up knowing the value of land. They were farmers. And uh, Donald had bought this piece on Holden Hill before I knew him. Uh, Donald was very proud of his land. And uh, it, he probably took me there to impress me. <laughs> he loved it. And I just remember being impressed with the land and the beauty of it. Most of my neighbors are opposed to Northern Pass. We don't want it. And it's been ex expressed in many ways and I still can't believe that they're pursuing it. They're still coming ahead and they're acting like we have no voice in the matter. They're um, just bullying their way right down through, you know, Northern New Hampshire if they possibly can. What about the basic premise, Martin, that these rock-bottom natural gas prices are a game-changer for energy markets and possibly a game-changer for this project? Well, as you know, uh, in order for the project to be successful, the energy would have to be economic. In other words, we build the line. Uh, we provide to Hydro-Quebec the right to transmit energy along the line. They would uh, put it into the New England marketplace. The only way to sell that uh, product into the market is if it is economic. Um, Hydro-Quebec and, and Northern Pass, for that matter, fully expect that this product, this energy, will be delivered into the market at savings. So there's actually a lot of question as to whether or not the power that's coming in, if it's priced fairly um, by, by Hydro-Quebec, uh, will be low cost or will have much of an impact on the uh, wholesale prices in New England at all.
you know, as we've reviewed the project, it looks like they, they have um, three options to sell power from Hydro-Quebec into the, outside of the, um, the province to Ontario, New York City, and, and to New England. Uh, it would make sense that if they have those options on a day ahead or a week ahead market, they're going to sell that at the highest price they can get. So this theory that somehow the project is going to come in with low-cost power is a little uh, inconsistent with the uh, task uh, the project has, which is maximize and get the highest price that they can. The prices will go right up, I'm sure of it. You know, that will, it won't save anybody any money. It'll put a lot of money in the pockets of the people who are in charge of Hydro-Quebec. The savings, it's entirely unclear how they would get to PSNH customers. And so we may even see a scenario where PSNH customers who live along the right of way, who live near where the project will be sited, will actually see their power rates continue to go up after the project's built. existing transmission line out there now it's 115 kV and it, it was here when we moved here we knew about it and we did our research and we made the decision to move here we're, we're comfortable with it we never bargained for a 345,000 volt power line moved closer to our house uh, one of the ways that Northern Pass is going to affect our property physically is um, they'll be removing the tree line that uh, blocks our home from the existing power lines that are 70 odd feet away from our house right now. We were told by a PSNH representative that the, they could put the tower as close as 16 feet beside our house and the wires had to be at least 29 feet above our house. And that's to me that's rather frightening because we have three children. We're really concerned about health issues, electromagnetic field issues, they've been uh, correlated with childhood leukemia. It's, 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 a, uh, it's very concerning to us and the fact that they're being proposed to come so close to our home and, and above it is, is, has been one of the, the most frightening things about this for us. I've lived here more than half of my life. Um, we, we cut down trees on the road and built the road that leads into our house. We cleared the property. We have our blood, sweat, and tears in, into this home that we've worked really hard on for a long time. Now the threat is that they will, they will put three times as much power, almost right close to our house and we're afraid of that and with the history that we have in designing and building the home and raising our family here and the, the little improvements that you continue to do uh, all that could be destroyed Could we possibly buy a place with an easement on it? This is a distribution line. These easements were granted in the late 1940s to bring power to New Ham to this part of New Hampshire, and we're happy to do our part. It has a purpose. This new line, as far as I'm concerned, has no purpose. There's no reason to ask people to make any kind of sacrifice here in New Hampshire for that line. There's just no justification for it. So it's, it's, it's unfair to even ask or expect.
My husband and I chose to live in northern New Hampshire because we both enjoyed being in the out of doors, working in the out of doors, and having the opportunity to recreate in the back country. And neither one of us wanted to travel to do that. We did not want to commute. We chose to live in Sugar Hill primarily because of its proximity to the White Mountain National Forest and to the other open lands that are available for recreation here. I think that if the Northern Pass is built, it would affect where people would choose to spend their time. If, if somebody's coming to the White Mountains to get away from the city, to get away from that kind of infrastructure, they would probably choose an area where they would not cross or run into the Northern Pass. They might choose to travel to the east side of the White Mountains. They might choose to go into Vermont, all of which have great recreational opportunities. But it's a shame to think that people would avoid the Franconia area or the Great North Woods where the Northern Pass crosses some significant recreational areas. I serve on the Chamber of Commerce here in town. Um, we polled the, uh, the members, and as you can imagine, you know, Chamber of Commerce consists mostly of local businesses. A lot of local businesses here in this area rely on tourism, and there's a real legitimate concern about uh, the impact of such a project like Northern Pass having on the reasons why this is a popular place for people to want to come on their vacation. And are they going to choose some place that's not impacted by Northern Pass and go elsewhere because of the, the existence of this, of this uh, scar in the landscape? People also come up here to recreate. And when they see something like, like that, people come up here to get away from that stuff. Uh, a lot of people work for the uh, uh, tourism camps, lodges, uh, kitchens. The tourism, is, uh, tourism is the biggest industry up here. This land that God has allowed us to use while we're here on this earth is one of the most important things I believe you can have. And I treasure it, and I'm going to honor the heritage and the uh, inheritance that I have received through my husband and his family, and I'm not selling. I don't believe in the whole project anyway. I hate to see these towers. They're going to ruin the uh, view, the scenic view. All we have is tourism left up here. And the, no one's going to want to come and hunt and fish and snowmobile and enjoy the scenery when those, those ugly towers are standing there. So, no, I won't sell. And I, you know, I have always felt that when I turned down something that I knew was right to turn down, the Lord provided for me in some other way. And that's how I'll operate. I just can't, I can't imagine living here with the power line here. I just can't imagine. Our house will be worthless if they build the Northern Pass the way it's planned right now. Yeah, representatives from Northern Pass and people affiliated with them have tried to rebut our feelings of property devaluation. And I've heard numbers thrown out that you may see a devaluation of anywhere from zero to 10%. But, Which is a joke. Um, you know, if you can't sell your property, I mean, it's basically been devalued to zero. And we're experiencing that right now. I work as a real estate agent here in uh, Franconia, and uh, we serve Franconia East and Sugar Hill area primarily, but also you know a lot of northern towns in uh, Grafton, Coos, and uh, County. And uh, I've had several experiences in real estate where the presence of the Northern Pass uh, or the possibility of the Northern Pass has made people change decisions about property that they want to either buy or sell. I've had situations where people uh, had property that was impacted by the Northern Pass, whether it's directly or, or possibly, where their property value has gone down. Uh, I've seen directly uh, homes that have sold for you know a significant percentage lower than they would have 
if the Northern Pass wasn't in the, either in the view shed or potentially on the property or bordering the property. Um, I, I honestly believe that anyone says th that uh, the Northern Pass doesn't have a negative value on real estate value isn't telling the truth because I've seen it. One of the reasons uh, I became active in this No Northern Pass initiative was um, primarily uh, provided by a nudge uh, after reading an initial preliminary survey that was put out, uh, impact of value of high voltage transmission lines. Given my real estate background and experience, I felt that this issue of value was given, you know, served just a injustice by just using four properties overall in one town and four properties in another town and then broad brushing the whole state and say, you don't have to worry about value. That just did not sit well with me. About 40% of the homes in Sugar Hill are second homes. So second homes are an incredibly important part of our economy here. We get a lot of tax revenue for very little service for all these second homes. And I really think if you put this line, the Northern Pass line, with, that disfigures the landscape, no one is going to buy a piece of land and build a second home overlooking an industrial corridor. They're just not going to do it. So the people who design that home, the people who build that home, the electricians who wire it, the plumbers who plumb it, the people who mow the lawns, the restaurants where the people go, all of those people will be damaged by this. They'll go somewhere else. You know, the jobs impact of Northern Pass is potentially meaningful to the state of New Hampshire. It's a big construction project. Any big construction project brings with it a large number of jobs, and there are generally a variety of jobs. Uh, there was a recent mailer put out by uh, PSNH, and it had a picture of a, a linesman and some quotes from him promoting the project, talking about how it was green energy, how it was going to promote jobs, how a lot of the linemen in and around this area have to go out of state to actually work. And this is great because it'll be a project close to home, and he mentioned that he leaves his home for prolonged periods and is, you know, he's apart from his wife and his kids. And I can, I can sympathize with that. And I, but I, I wonder if those guys could sympathize with our situation here. I mean, a 345,000 volt power line um, run right up over your house. I mean, this is, this is where we live. This is where we raise our kids. Um, this is everything we have. And I wonder, I wonder what that means to them. The Northern Pass project claims that uh, the project will create 1,200 construction jobs. You know, any job in this economy that any project brings should not be dismissed, but it also uh, was a conspicuously round number. And so the New England Power Generators Association did commission a study uh, in 2011. It's in the process of being uh, refreshed uh, for the Department of Energy process. And the conclusion was that while the project would bring some construction jobs, it's not very likely that the 1,200 jobs that are being talked about will be realized. It's probably closer to 600. But the other interesting part of that analysis is that not all of those jobs are going to be in northern New Hampshire, and not all those jobs are going to be in New Hampshire, in New Hampshire in general. The big expenditures around that project are the converter stations uh, and the steel and the cable um, for, the, uh, for the lines. A great deal of the, that, that uh, manufacturing production is just by the nature of it is going to take place outside of New Hampshire. We do know that some of the alternatives to Northern Pass, in terms of burying the line in transportation corridors, or in the energy alternatives, like pursuing renewable energy here in New England, or energy efficiency projects, those strategies create jobs too. So it isn't Northern Pass or nothing, it's Northern Pass jobs versus other types of energy jobs. So this seems to be getting complicated. The need for energy, the ways it's produced, and how much it cost has gotten all wrapped up with recreation and tourism, real estate, and scenic values. In 2013, Northern Pass developers announced a new route through northern New Hampshire. This new route includes burying eight miles of transmission lines in northern Coas County because several landowners there refused to sell their land, which Northern Pass needed to build overhead lines. 
Despite the new route, those opposed to the project remain entrenched. I think the Northern Pass project is about dollars. It's about business. Uh, it's about putting money in the pockets of a, of a private enterprise. It's not what's for the greater good of the state of New Hampshire. New Hampshire exports 80% as much power as, it, as we consume. That really says it all. And we don't, we don't think that's a good trade. I myself do not think it's necessary. I don't think we need the uh, energy in New Hampshire. And I think we're being used as a corridor to get the power from Canada to Connecticut and give this company a chance to make billions and billions of dollars and in the meantime really cut our state right down the middle with these ugly horrendous towers. It's not just you don't want it in your backyard it's just the whole thing just doesn't make sense. In a way, it, it, it is a NIMBY thing, and not in my backyard, but I call it the EB thing. That's everybody's backyard. And that's the, the attitude that many opponents to the Northern Pass carry. The impacts don't end just at the crossing. You know, because we manage for a scenic trail and viewshed impacts, there are you know, multiple viewpoints where the project potentially would be visible from. And that's not even saying you know, a visitor who comes up to hike this range for a couple days, possibly drove under it multiple times coming up here on the highway and maybe was looking to get away from development and then, you know, there it is again. So that's another piece of what we consider to be cumulative impacts is how many times are you exposed to a particular development. If some of the values associated with the Appalachian Trail, I think most people would agree that it's that sense of, of remoteness, that sense of being in nature, you know, away from the busyness of our everyday lives. Uh, really, the original vision for the Appalachian Trail by Benton Mackay was really just about that. It was to escape the ills of an increasingly urbanized society. Um, back in 1921 is when he first you know, proposed the AT. So that's probably even more important now as we've you know, increasingly built up areas around the trail here in the east. The Appalachian Trail, the Long Trail, I mean, those are classic national treasures that and, and if you keep encroaching on them with power lines or this and that you, you can't get it back you can't get that wild that nature that out there feel back once you lose it and if we keep chipping away at it it's going to be gone and that, that would be just tragic we're the, we're the stewards of this beautiful land we are Got to take and, care and of it. Everybody doesn't start to have a little bit of that in their hearts. Gosh, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be gone. I will always fight for what's right for the state of New Hampshire, what's best for the state of New Hampshire. Like, like I said before, I'm born and raised here. I got, you know, maple syrup and granite coursing through my veins. This is, this is home. It always will be. And, uh, you know, to me, the Northern Pass Project threatens, is a threat to our state's natural beauty to the health of its citizens, and, and it's all for corporate greed. And to me, uh, if you let corporations have their way and do things the easiest way that's going to put the most dollars in their pockets, it's going to have a harmful effect on our state. Northern Pass uh, may leave a few permanent jobs, no meaningful reductions in emissions, and a group of disaffected landowners and communities who have to live with this project for the rest of their lives. While people throughout New Hampshire may oppose the project, interestingly enough, Northern Pass developers don't need their approval to erect their 1,500 towers through 31 communities in the state. To start construction, Northern Pass needs to secure three permits, including one from the U.S. Department of Energy, i.e. the President, and a special use permit from the White Mountain National Forest to alter their current rights of way in the Kilkenny and Kinsman Ranges. Once those are secured, Northern Pass must submit a permit application to the state of New Hampshire's Site Evaluation Committee, a 16-member panel consisting of heads of several agencies in state government, several members of the Public Utilities Commission, and a council for the public appointed by the Attorney General. I look at the Site Evaluation Committee as kind of the, the last stop, the last um, place that we can stop this project. 
and um, I have said I, I don't, I'm not crazy about the project. Um, if it has to be done, it should all be underground. Um, but I'm, I don't see the value to the state of New Hampshire. You're, you're talking about changing the face of this state for a private project that is not needed for reliability in this state. What are we doing? Um, if, if, it, if it is so important to them that they do it the way they want to do it, then they need to give us all the information um, and then let us make a decision. March of this year, 2013, we were able to get two warrant articles put onto our uh, ballot for uh, election day. The first one was a, a straight uh, yes or no um, to put the town on record as to whether the people oppose or are for Northern Pass. And that one passed overwhelmingly against. The town was finally on record as being opposed to Northern Pass. The second warrant article was specific to future transmission project lines, saying that the town was against them in general, and also should any of these projects be foisted on us, we would prefer burial uh, of any such lines. They voted that there could be no towers in the town of Stewartstown, that it would have to be underground, it would have to be buried. The shocking thing that you find out, you think you live in a representative democracy and that the people's will will be heard and all of that, and the shocking thing is that the permitting process does not really allow the affected communities to have a, a real say, to have a seat at the table in the decision process. The towns are allowed to make a case. They're allowed to scrape up the money to hire legal counsel to represent them in this judicial type hearing, but they're not involved in the actual decision. Well, the thing that I find so interesting is that, so there's 33 towns being affected, from what I understand, and 32 of them have come out with ballots saying, no, they don't want the project. Mm. And yet the project is still moving forward. Right. So I don't really understand how that works. How can, you know, the people say, no, we don't want it, and yet the corporation says, mm, still, it's still coming, however, so, you know, just step aside, because here it comes. It's important to me and, and it makes me very happy to see that Deerfield, you know, is in the game. People know that. They know now that we have been actively working against this and we've added our voice to the to the protest and the opposition up and down the entire line. It's it's you can't really say it's a North Country issue anymore. The Northern Pass project really has united people in the North Country, in um, my district. Actually, Deerfield, all along the path, people, whether they are Republican or Democrat or undeclared, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but the majority of people are opposed to this project and they have been able to set aside partisan issues to come together and um, make sure that New Hampshire's views and vistas and their landscapes, their economic development, and tourism is protected. So more than four years after Northern Pass was first proposed, its fate is still undecided. 2015 looks like it will be the year that the project's permits will either be granted or denied. Those living along the current right-of-way, like the Neely and Shoemaker families, are left waiting for the powers that be to determine their fate. The new route, proposed in 2013, no longer threatens the McCulloch's property, though Mark and Chelsea remain opposed to the project. Lynn Placey and Rod McCollister and others in the North Country have granted conservation easements on their properties to the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests, and that will prevent transmission lines from ever crossing their land. If Northern Pass receives its permits from the federal and state governments, legal battles are sure to ensue, and it may be years before our story reaches a conclusion. People are not backing down. They're not giving in. I mean, we're talking about standing in front of bulldozers if it comes to that. We are not going to let this happen. We're just private people. I'm, I'm not the type of person who, who enjoys, you know, being in the public eye to any degree, and yet, 
we are we are forced to to take on these kinds of roles to just just to defend what it is we have and try and keep it from being taken from us and ruined and to try and prevent an injustice and it's word. not something that we that we relish it and you you know you can get a little bit uh, angry about that being being forced to constantly be vigilant and to fight and and it it it, it does it makes me angry that we've gotten to this place to have this burden in our lives that we have to carry around and that's what you do too you carry it around it's never it's never gone there's like never a, there's never i would love nothing more than to wake up one morning and and know and be sure that this wasn't going to happen and that things were going to stay the same here for us but we don't we don't have that and we're not going to have it the state motto live free or die means something to a core to a core of this, the people that have been, that, that care about New Hampshire. I have a feeling that somebody would be dragging my tail to jail before I would allow those lines to go through without a fight. And I have a strong feeling that there are others that feel the same way. I pray that that doesn't have to happen to anybody because it's it's ridiculous uh, it's certainly going to be unsightly it's not going to add anything to the landscape uh, and it's unnecessary they don't even need the power actually it's just a vehicle that's designed to make money for another country and we're in the way <laughs>